um, confidentiality agreements. But all I can say is they're a pack of cheating. C nearly said something I shouldn't have done. They're just not fair people, and they've held me up for so long, and it's caused a, a commotion in my life, and nearly destroyed my life and career. And it's about time that the, the this case is done. And on December the 11th, I'm hoping they're going to do the right thing and release an innocent man from purgatory. Because that's where I am at the moment. I don't know if I'm coming or going or going left or right with my boxing career, not to fitness or whatever. But as to moving forward, knowing what I'm going to do, I'm missing out on big fights. Big, big fights. I've only got a small window of opportunity to, to make money enough to provide for my family. Let's face it, they've cost a man, a married man with four kids, cost him his right to earn a living. That's got to be a breach of a human uh, rights act, doesn't it? I've not earned a living in two years. Nothing. How does that get compensated for then? Your, your, well, the two year period, especially after obviously your win in Dusseldorf, that was your peak, like you said, your window to earn the money, to have those kind of fights. You haven't had that, so how does that get compensated for? Well, how do they compensate it? They've got to have a big checkbook. And they've got to write it out generously. Because look how many fights I've missed through this false accusations. The truth will come out sooner or later. And when it does, and they set me free, this is like a Muhammad Ali story. They clipped his wings for three year, three and a half year. And they're doing the same to me in an attempt to rid me out of the sport, run me out. But I'm sticking my heels in the mud and I'm taking them all the way. And I'm confident that I'm going to win this case. Because when you're innocent, the truth has to come out sooner or later. It can't stay hidden and it can't prove an innocent man guilty if he hasn't done anything. Are you confident that one way or another, in December, however long the, this is going on for, that you get some I do not know, because if they say it's Tuesday, it's Tuesday. They do what they want. Look how long they've, they've had me messing around for now. I was in Spain training away. <coughs> I was down to this weight before. Come back for a few days, do the court case, it'll all be done. You'll know which way you're going and crack on with your life. I came back, put it back seven or eight months. They're holding my life up. I'm on old. I can't even go and get another job because I don't know what I'm doing. I really do not know what's going on with it all. They won't tell the lawyers nothing. They're keeping everything close to the self. And listen, make the decision. Prove me innocent. Give me my life back that you have destroyed. Totally, totally innocent. As well as being in the gym, obviously you've started training again. Are you maybe mentally or actually physically, if you like, mapping out what you want to do in 2018? Yeah, listen, providing I win this case in 17, 16 and 17 has been terrible years for me. I just want to put them behind me and crack on with the future. I want to make 18 and 19 my glory years. They've took two of my prime years out of my life. They're never going to come back. No one can compensate age. They've affected my legacy in boxing with their antics. I could have cemented my legacy in boxing as the greatest everywhere of all times. I would have at least have had the opportunity to. But it was taken from me for no fault of my own. After he said there was no case to answer to. But now I'm planning my life again. I'm planning a big 2018 return of the Mac. This time I want to be myself. I don't want to play a character anymore. I want the public to see the real me. The people's champion. The happy-go-lucky Tyson Fury. That everybody loves and adores. Not the confident brash character. The cockiness. To sell tickets. If these promoters out there can't do their own job, I'm not going to do it for them. Because they don't help me with my job. They don't physically get in there and start throwing punches. So I ain't physically going to be a performing actor. 
I'm going to be Tyson Fury, the real Don Perignon. What is your promotional situation at the moment? Promotional situation at the moment is, um, again, we can't, I can't make any promotional deals with anybody until this case is sorted. If someone said to me, we'll give you 50 million quid to fight Coogan Cassius on a, on a Friday afternoon, I couldn't do it because I'm physically not able to do it. Damn right you're not. No, I'm not. So you'd be rescued from a lot of pain. <laughs> so until this is clear, that, that, that there's is... Nothing, there's yeah. nothing. Someone could come to me literally with it, whatever they wanted and I couldn't take it because I'm not in a position to fight. <coughs> I'm sure there's promoters out there that love to sign me up and love to get me back in the ring and fighting again and involved in big fights. But it's not possible at the moment. So all I'm focusing on at the moment is keeping strong, keeping the faith, keep training and doing the right things. And that's got to be a step in the right direction. Because health is, is better than wealth. And what I was doing wasn't healthy for me, eating and drinking all the time. I'm having no routine. So now I'm back in the gym, I feel more focused. I feel as if I've got a story to tell as well, a massive story that the world needs to know because this can't continue to happen to other people and the stuff that I've been through, depression, all these mental health problems, my story can help others, inspire others. I've gone from rags to riches back to rags again, from 18 stone to 27, from a clean living man to drugs and alcohol, back to the heavyweight champion of the world again within two years. That's a story to tell. People will be inspired by the story. And I hope the legacy and the story I leave behind will help others in the future. What not to do and what to do. Blueprint. Of your own admission, um, you spoke and you have spoken about um, is it fair to call it a, a problem with drugs, as in recreational drugs? Is what a problem? What you've spoken about in the past. I'm calling it a problem, I'm not saying it's a problem now, but a, uh, a past problem, if you like. I wouldn't call it a problem. It wasn't a problem. It was just a pastime, bit of fun, buzz, whatever you want to call it. But it was more drove to that position by what was going on with my life and career at the time. You think how hard it's been for me over the last two years. Being falsely accused of the damn right worstest thing I could have done. Of all the other things I've been called a bigot, a sexist, a homophobe, whatever else they want to call me, I may have been all of those things, but the one thing I'm not is a drugs cheat. So to me that's the worstest thing that a sports person could be. He may as well be whatever he wants to be. But a drugs cheat is one thing I'm not. And I will not be convicted of it. And I will not be forced to admit anything I haven't done. So, as to having a drugs problem, no. I was forced into a position, into a damn right low place. I've been as low as any man can go. And back again. All because of what these have done to me. Before this, I never took a drug in my life, ever. I got to 27, won the world titles and everything. Been around the block 10 times. Never took a drug. But through these UCAD, and through all this case, the pressures they put me under, nearly lost my wife and kids over it all as well. This is what I've had to put up with through these annoying people. And that's where we're at today. So was it a drugs problem? No. It was a UCAD problem. A persecution. Prejudice. Racist. Behaviour. Towards an individual who's totally innocent. So that's what forced me to drugs. And for all people out there who's watching, they, I can tell you you can be forced into stuff. Depression is one of the worstest things I ever battled. More fearsome than 10 Klitschko's and 10 Anthony Joshua's 
10 Derek Chisoras and 10 anybody else. The hardest fight he ever had was with depression. Would you say that's a part of your life that's always going to be there? Depression. Do you know what it is? I found a way out to overcome it. Which will be very interesting. And it'll be published in my book. Something that works for you. Yeah. And it works for other people. At the moment, I'm a mentor for, for quite a few famous people. Life coaching. Ambassador for mental health. People are texting me and inboxing me and stuff like that for help and advice all the time. Because if I'd been through and overcome it to get back to where I am today, then anybody can. Because I was as low as anybody could go. Couldn't go any lower. The next thing was suicide. But now back. Back on top. And I'm going to be king of the world again for the second time. And this time no one will be able to take it from me. Because what don't kill you makes you stronger. I've got more fire burning inside than I did before. I want it more. There's more pain involved. When they say you can't have something, it makes you want it even more. The heart grows fonder for stuff you can't have. And when you're told you're going to get banned for a long time, you want it more and more and more. And there's not a man out there born from his mother that can beat the Gypsy King. Especially not a man with a pair of gloves on. In a boxing ring. With a referee, with a lot of judges. You haven't just got to overcome the size and the reach and the moving and all that. You've got to overcome the burning passion inside never to lose a fight. The will, determination, the drive of this individual. I don't call it return of the Mac for nothing. I am the Mac daddy of it all. It's my throne. That I never lost. I'm the king of that throne, the heavyweight division, the emperor. And I'm still here. They may have tried to shut me out in the cold, but I'm still here. I haven't gone anywhere. The, my fans love me even more now than they did before. My popularity is on the up. Nothing can stop me or deter me away from my path. I've gained faith back in the Lord again. No one can stop me on this mission. Back to the top. It's a real life Rocky story. From zero to hero to zero back to hero again. But this time it's going to be done with the real me. I'm not some pretend cartoon character. This is one of your best interviews you've ever done, mate. <laughs> you know, it's been about two and a half years since we sat down. Yeah. We've done this little, is going to get bits. you so much views. Yeah. This is an in-depth conversation, isn't it? Maybe I should have sold this story to you, Goob. You still can. Can you pay me 50p for it? Buy me a coffee. Ben. Um, we saw Manuel Char win yeah. the WBA, let's call it, the regular title from uh, against uh, Ustinov, who yeah. obviously you were supposed to fight at one point in your career as well. Um, yeah, I just saw you retweet something the other day uh, as a first fight back. Is that something that you're looking at? Possibly, Char? First of all, I'd like to say congratulations to Manuel Char, one of my Muslim brothers. And what he's done in his life is very, very, very good. This man was stabbed in the guts and nearly died in intensive care. Then he had to have an hip operation. He couldn't walk for months. To train his way back, doing a little bit of elastic band movements and stuff. And he's got his life back on track. And won the heavyweight championship of the world. The first Lebanese heavyweight champion in history. And probably the last. This man has got to be on par with King Darius himself. For what he's done. 
and what he's achieved against all the odds. This is almost like a Tyson Fury story, but with Manuel Char's name on it. I just want to say congratulations, my brother. You've done marvellous. Congratulations. For sure. Congrats. Achievement. Never to be forgotten. History books. Is that your interest in fighting him? <laughs> yeah, I'll knock him out the ground. <laughs> no. Listen, it's, it's a tough fight for anybody. Manuel Char can really fight. Or else he wouldn't be everywhere champion of the world. Um, he's been in there with Klitschko, Povetkin. He's been in there with some good fighters. And, and give a good account of yourself. So yeah, the biggest fight that I'm interested in. A good test for me at this stage of my career. Um, and to come back with an heavyweight championship of the world fight would be something. But if that fight's not possible, there's many fights out there that it would be possible. You made a video the other day. As soon as uh, David Hay withdrew with his fight with Tony Bellew, offering yourself to fight Tony Bellew for next May. We saw a clip from Tony Bellew, I think he was on Soccer AM. Yep. Seems to be welcome, welcoming that fight, branding you Stavros flatly. Um, I think previously I've never really heard Tony Bellew speak about the possibility of fighting you until then. No, it's a, um, it's a bold, shrewd move. Bold move because it's a tough fight, and shrewd because he'll get a hell of a lot of money out of fighting me. So, very clever and educated move. Why wouldn't he not want to fight me? Because it's a, it's a great fight that he could win. I've been out of the ring two and a half years, don't forget. Through no fault of my own. Um, and to come back with somebody on as high as level as Tony Bellew would be, would it be a suicide mission? A match fit heavyweight, former cruiserweight champion, a man who beat the great David Hay. And let's face it, when I was going to fight the great David Hay, nobody gave me a chance of winning. So how can so many people write off Tony Bellew against me when he beat the great David Hay, who I couldn't have beat, no chance, but the man pulled out twice from me. So how are they saying Tony Bellew's an easy fight for me when he's a match fit?